From inside the warehouse at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. Paul Mancano and Brendan Mortensen here with you. Brendan, quick softball update. We are still totally defeated. Yep. Have not yet won a game. No, we have not. But we stormed back in an incredible rally. I believe we were down 8-1. to one, We were. Headed into the sixth and final inning in our most recent game. Second game of a doubleheader. We're one person short. So we're playing with eight in the field, which means no right fielder. So we're already at a disadvantage. And we mount this incredible rally where we rip off six runs, I think. Yeah. Make it an eight to seven game and come within one run of tying it. Yeah. And all of them came with two outs. Yes. It's not to toot my own horn, but I think I started the run scoring in the sixth. There were two outs when I was up. We hadn't scored a run. I hit. I think a two-run double, and then we just kept rolling from there. You, I think we hit 10 hitters in the bottom of the sixth. Yeah, we batted around, regardless yeah. of how you define it. Uh, I had really not been able to find a base hit all game. I had three flyouts to left. Hard hit balls, exit velo over 110 for each one of those, and I just couldn't seem to find grass out there. He was, was getting Ryan Mountcastled out there. I was. It was like the wall had been pushed back, and then I change up my walk-up song. Last-minute decision, I, I, I turn to the team captain, I say, give me life as a highway. Just off the top of the dome. Don't know where it came from. Don't even like that song particularly much. And uh, he plays it, and what do you know? I drill a single up the middle. I, I turn and I point to Tim Leonard, our producer, uh, in the dugout. He's loose in his mind. It was a perfect recreation of that. The game that won best game of the year on the Mass and All Access podcast for the 2022 Orioles where Trey Mancini walked it off against the Angels. Yeah. And he points back to the dugout screaming. It was that in a nutshell. And then, of course, Tim and I did the Call of Duty goggles to each other. It was Except electric. there were no fans and nobody cared. And it didn't win the game. And it didn't win the game. It put us down like three at that point. But you ran down to first base and you said, maybe life is a highway. Yeah. And frankly, I want to ride it all night long. Yeah. Ooh. I think in the first game, Tim Leonard Just also the lyrics. recreated a great Orioles moment, which was a bang-bang play at first. Mm -hmm. And he did the Gunnar Henderson, like, safe sign as he's crossing first. Yeah. Not that it's just a Gunnar Henderson right, thing, but, but Gunnar Henderson has, has done that a few times, and it's been fun. Yeah, so. it's. I mean, that's always an electric moment when you beat out an infield single. Yeah. So, uh, wow. I mean, we should probably get a win at some point. I think just That'd for, be nice. It was nice yeah. for team morale to... to mount that rally but i believe our captain walked off the field chanting we don't suck and then we were kind of like well we still do we still do <laughs> we still lost, lost the game yeah um all right on this podcast we are going to talk primarily about jordan lyles because that is the first major decision the orioles have to make this offseason is whether or not to pick up his 2023 contract option however first brendan we should take care of some housekeeping and i realized on our last podcast that we didn't talk about Jake Cave, one of the Orioles' waiver claims. Just kind of flew over that one. There are a couple more waiver claims that they've added since then as well. So three in total that we're going to discuss really quickly. But overall, it is so early in the offseason. We haven't even hit November. Free agency, Major League free agency hasn't even begun. The overall point, I think, to make is that the Orioles' 40-man roster is going to look vastly different come February than it does right now. So we're not trying not to overreact to any of these waiver claims. Yeah, we'll start with Jake Cave. He's a 30-year-old outfielder, had a 644 OPS a season ago. I don't think he really factors into the Orioles' outfield plans all that much because, you know, barring a trade, we know who the three starting outfielders for next season are more than likely going to be. We know that there's also quality outfield options behind them in Ryan McKenna, in Kyle Stowers, and there's also going to be some prospects coming up at some point next year, maybe a Colton Kowser halfway through the year, and maybe somebody else will make the opening day roster, like a Robert Newstrom, who knows? So I don't really see Jake Cave playing a big factor into those decisions, no. but... He is a reliable defensive outfielder. He can play all three outfield positions. This kind of strikes me as if, okay, if he stays in the organization, then maybe he is a AAA Norfolk player who, if you have some injuries in the outfield, you can rely on him in the big leagues to play some quality defense, put together some decent at-bats. But I don't think he's going to be a big factor if he stays on the team. And he was at least a name that I think Orioles fans 
may or may not have heard of. We had heard of Jake Cave. These next two guys, I don't know about you, Brendan, I don't think I'd heard these guys' names. Nope. They play in the National League, so they were both coming from the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, two catchers, Aramis Garcia and Mark Colesbury. Garcia's the older one. He's 30 years old, hit 213, has a negative war in 116 big league games in his career between Cincinnati, San Francisco, and Oakland. And then Colesbury, a little m- more intriguing, 27 years old, but has barely played in the big leagues. Only 10 big league games in his career, uh, and really didn't hit very well in the minors last year. Hit just 163 in 46 minor league games. So when you see Orioles claim two catchers, that makes six catchers on their 40-man roster again. I think there was a little bit of overreaction from some portion of the fan base that was saying, are the Orioles not going to sign a catcher now? Are they going to roll into next year with four catchers or six catchers on the 40-man roster, especially after they agree to the one-year contract with Anthony Bemboom? But look, I think the Orioles make these waiver claims now because they like the player. I don't think they're really caring about the position very much right now. I don't think they're saying we need to add a few catchers via waiver claim in the offseason. I think they're sitting there in October, player comes across the waiver wire, and they go, I like this guy. Let's let's grab him. I like him better than Lewis Head, one of the guys that they designated for assignment. I like him better than Bo Solcer. Bo Solcer. Again, the hardest name to Tongue say. Tongue twister. Hopefully he got claimed by the Pirates. Uh, so they're liking the player. They don't really care about the position right now. I think it's a, it is a factor, but it's really player over position. Yeah, and again, it's entirely possible that we're not going to be talking about these guys yeah. in a few months because you know they just might not be on the team. But it makes sense that the Orioles are kind of just getting rid of some bullpen arms that they really didn't need. Like Lewis Head, Bo Solcer, they were two who, you know, could potentially eat innings for the Orioles in the bullpen down the stretch, but you didn't really see them factoring into the 2023 team at all. And now with claiming a few catchers, you're just increasing your options in terms of internal options before you start looking at free agency. I think the Orioles are still going to go after a free agent backup catcher, but they also just signed one today as well. Yes. Not a free agent. A free agent, yeah, in Bamboo. Right. So... That is at least a backup backup option, I think. It is putting a a baseline, a floor for, we know this guy can play in the big leagues. He did it for us very briefly last year. But still, I think they are going to address the position in free agency. But, Brendan, you mentioned these guys may not even make the team. And that's something that, remember a couple years ago, a couple off-seasons ago, the Orioles claimed Yomer Sanchez, and then he made it through all of the winter, with the team, stuck on the 40-man roster. They didn't didn't designate him for assignment until pretty much right before opening day. And we had penciled him in as the 2021 opening day second baseman, and it never came to fruition. Yeah, he was drafted in the in our, our podcast edition of the All-Orioles yeah. team before the season. And that was something Michael Elias continued to mention, and we didn't heed his warning when he said, look, it's a waiver claim. This is not... Something that somebody that we're committing big dollar amounts to, we're not signing them in free agency. We did a whole podcast on Lucius Fox, who was on the roster for a week, and we were thinking maybe Lucius Fox could be a factor at shortstop in 2021. Ashton Goudeau, uh, Chris Shaw, all of these guys that we were waiver claims during the offseason and never made it to the big leagues with the Orioles. So, again, Lower your expectations and, and try not to overreact to some off-season waiver claims. And I think we're even reacting less to these waiver claims than we were in the past because, like you said, Yomer Sanchez was somebody that we penciled in as a starter. Yeah. Not, none of these guys that the Orioles have claimed are going to be starters. In, in fairness to us, in our, in our defense, so had other members of the media. Yeah. It wasn't just us. Right. But none of these guys that the Orioles have claimed are going to be starters. We don't even really think they're going to be big factors, if factors at all, at the major league level. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about somebody who was a big factor for the Orioles in 2022. And if they decide to bring him back, could be a big factor in 2023. And that's Jordan Lyles. Now, Lyles signed that one-year, $7 million contract with the Orioles last offseason that contained a team option for 2023, which is worth $11 million, with a $1 million buyout, and $500,000 bonus if traded. When he signed that deal with the Orioles, or agreed to it shortly before lockout, and then eventually signed it three months later, we were saying that 
number of $11 million seems awfully high for a guy that you're not even committing $11 million to right now. And it seemed like a fail-safe for the Orioles if he goes on to have a career year and bursts out in his age 31 season and the Orioles then have an option to pick him back up at a reasonable $11 million. But otherwise, if he gives you what his career average is, then you're probably going to move on. Right now, the $11 million is right in the medium zone between too much to hand a guy in free agency and worth it because of the production that he gave you. So it is. this is almost a 50-50 to me as to whether the Orioles should pick up Lyles' $11 million option. Yeah, and looking back at his season in 2022, I think you said, you know, it, it wasn't going to be a career year, more than likely, for Jordan Lyles. It was a fail-safe, that $11 million. Yeah. If all of a sudden he pitched out of his mind in 2022, you could bring him back next year, and it would almost be a bargain. I think Jordan Lyles gave you pretty much exactly what you were expecting for $7 million. He had a 442 ERA. He was 32nd in all of baseball in innings pitched. We've talked about him throughout the season and how much value he gave the Orioles, not only as a veteran presence in a clubhouse that lost John Means in that starting rotation, but as somebody who was, as he put it, was for the boys in terms of innings pitched because he would consistently go five, six, seven innings, and he would be able to save the bullpen and save Brandon Hyde from having to bring a bullpen arm in in the fifth inning. Jordan Lyles was consistently going deep into games. He was throwing a ton of pitches, and his numbers were better last year than they were in Texas the year before. They were his probably his best numbers since the 2019 season because the previous few seasons he had been leading baseball in hits allowed, in home runs allowed, but he was able to get those numbers down a little bit, and I think he provided you exactly what you thought he would in Baltimore. 32 starts on the season. The only start he missed was the one late in the year where he had that stomach virus. Of those 32 starts, only three went shorter than four innings, and one of those was because of a rain delay that knocked him out of the game. And his average start, was five and two-thirds innings. So 13 quality starts of those 32, which is tied for 47th in baseball. It's not a whole lot in terms of 13, but that's more than, I think, the conglomerate of Mike Bauman, of Zach Lowther, of Alexander Wells, guys that would have taken that spot otherwise would have given you because those guys had a much lower floor and... Frankly, Lyles filled a spot that I think we were saying could have been filled by a younger guy, but those younger guys didn't step up, and they ended up needing Lyles for every inning that he gave them. He saved the bullpen, he was a reliable force in that rotation, and he was every bit the veteran leader, like you said, Brendan, that they were hoping that they were getting when they signed him. His value comes not necessarily in quality of innings, but in number of innings. And while that was hugely valuable for the Orioles in 2022, will it be as valuable in 2023 for an Orioles team that is hoping to be competitive from start to finish, not just for the second half of the season? So, Paul, you mentioned some of the younger starting pitchers, and that's kind of the question that I want to start with, which is even before we get into the possibilities of a different pitcher that you would bring in in free agency, right. let's just talk about the internal options because I think that's a question as well. I think there are two absolute locks for the loca- for the rotation next year in Dean Kramer and Kyle Bradish. Yeah. Grayson Rodriguez, assuming there are no injuries and assuming spring training goes the way that Michael Elias and company are hoping, I think Grayson Rodriguez is pretty close to a lock for the starting rotation. I can't imagine they start him in AAA Norfolk. I think he starts the season in the bigs. Yeah, so assuming that, everything goes right. Like So that's said. three. Yeah. And then with the final two spots, it remains to be seen whether Tyler Wells is going back to the bullpen or staying a starter. I think he probably stays a starter, which is four spots. Yeah. And then for a fifth spot, this is without Jordan Lyles, you had some pitchers with quality seasons in Austin Voth, Spencer Watkins. Spencer Watkins tailed off a bit towards the back end of the year. Austin Voth was really consistently good throughout. 
but Voth does have that bullpen flexibility. I think he's at least an option for the number five spot in the rotation. There's D.L. Hall, who the Orioles are hoping will be a starter next year, but Mike Elias has said he has a lot of room to grow. He's a possibility. Mike Bauman is a possibility. He got some starts at the back end of the season, looked pretty good, much younger than Jordan Lyles. He's a possibility for that fifth spot. So if you bring Jordan Lyles back on that $11 million option, is there even really a logical place for him to go? You didn't even mention John Means. And John Means comes back halfway through the season, more than likely, from Tommy John. So where does Jordan Lyles fit into that equation even without bringing in a free agent? So... I am intrigued by a lot of the names that were said in both. Maybe less so Watkins, but he is he put up some quality he's, innings. I think he's at least done enough to be in the conversation. Sure. Uh, D.L. Hall, of course, has the upside, has the ceiling. Mike Bauman, I still believe, can be an effective pitcher in the big leagues. But there are questions with all of those guys. D.L. Hall, Michael Elias said in September last year, has a ways to go to become an effective big league starter. And frankly, he incurred more struggles out of the bullpen in 2022 than I think he should have because he was given a pretty, not easy landing for a big league debut, but easier than going out there and starting. He struggled. Mike Bauman was back and forth between Norfolk and Baltimore, not putting up outstanding numbers in either location. He has some serious question marks. Austin Voth has that bullpen flexibility. Maybe you like him more out of the bullpen. Tyler Wells, I'm always intrigued by what he brings you, and I think that the successful starts that he had prove that he can be an effective starter, but his health has been a major concern over the course of his career. Going back to his days when he had Tommy John back in the minor leagues, he has had injuries almost every single season. Bringing back Jordan Lyles or a pitcher, a big league major league caliber pitcher in free agency, I think is a must. I think despite all of those intriguing options, I think you still need some stability in that rotation. And that's before you factor in potential injuries. That's before you look at, you know, spring training, injuries crop up every single year like they do. So you could go into next season with, you know, Grayson Rodriguez. Sure, he's going to be an opening day member of that rotation most likely, but he's a rookie. Dean Kramer is solid. Kyle Bradish is solid. But other than that, you're looking at some serious question marks. And I think the need for starting pitching doesn't diminish simply because you have a bulk of young, intriguing options because you need some stability in those five guys. I agree. But I think if you bring in a free agent pitcher, you could be looking at the start of the season with D.L. Hall in the bullpen, Mike Bauman in the bullpen, Austin Voth in the bullpen. True. And I'm not saying it is completely necessary to get Mike Bauman starts because he is not a high-end prospect, like even where Kyle Bradish was, or certainly not D.L. Hall or Grayson Rodriguez. I also don't think it's a must for Austin Voth to be in the starting rotation. I think he is a good potential long reliever, swingman type. He can be a spot starter if you need him to, but you're not going to be terribly upset if you haven't saved a spot in the rotation for Austin Voth. Yeah. I think the question mark for me comes with D.L. Hall. Yeah. Because again, he did struggle a little bit more than people thought he would this year. The command was not where it really needed to be. And clearly, he hasn't shown the Orioles enough to inspire confidence to say, hey, he is absolutely going to be a starter at the beginning of next year. Michael Elias was kind of saying, hey, we'll, he we'll see. About it. He's yeah. got a lot of work to do. But I don't know how long I want to keep D.L. Hall in the bullpen. Because the long-term plan for Hall still has to be a starter. It does. Because he has that front end of the rotation potential. And if you sign a free agent, which I do agree with you, they should sign a free agent starting pitcher. But if you're signing a free agent pitcher, where are you working D.L. Hall in? And maybe there's injuries and maybe this hypothetical problem isn't a problem at all because there's just, you know, hopefully not, but maybe there is an injury in the starting rotation and D.L. Hall just gets his work that way but you want to work them in at some point. I think the priority, though, should be to win games over developing D.L. Hall. And if the Orioles believe that they're better off going with a veteran in their rotation and keeping D.L. Hall in the bullpen, they should do that, and I think they're going to do that. 
So the priority is to win games, and it would be nice to see D.L. Hall develop into a great starting pitcher. But keep in mind, this is his age 24 season coming up. Dean Kramer didn't find success until his age 25, age 26 season. Tyler Wells didn't even join this organization until he was 25, 26. So there is still time for him to turn into a good starting pitcher. And so many of these playoff teams, in order to reach October, you need to have consistent pitching depth from start to finish. You can't be trading away multiple prospects at the deadline to try to get a fifth starter. you got to be trading away prospects at the deadline to get a reliable bullpen piece or a sixth starter. You need so much pitching depth to get through 162 games, and especially in this division, you are going to need to win as many games as possible during the regular season. And I would much rather have the problem of we can't squeeze D.L. Hall or Mike Bauman into the rotation because we are so loaded there because we signed a starting pitcher. I'd much rather have that problem than, well, we don't have enough guys that can give us quality starts on a weekly basis. And we need to go out and, and trade for somebody in July just to get us through the course of the season. Yeah, good problems to have. And, of course, there's no saying that Austin Voth will be able to repeat the great season we saw last year because he's had struggles in the past in Washington. And, you know, hopefully this year with the O's wasn't a fluke and Baltimore has been able to figure out some things with Voth that just flat out work and he is a different starting pitcher. But you never know. You could go back to kind of some old bad habits. You don't know how Spencer Watkins might hold up. Like you said, Tyler Wells has some injury concerns. So I agree with you that I think the Orioles should sign a free agent starting pitcher. But of course, the question is, who is that going to be? Is that Jordan Lyles for $11 million? Or could you get somebody else with that $11 million? Could you increase the payroll a little bit? Look for a starter in the $15 to $20 million range. I think the question is not, should they sign a free agent pitcher, but how should you spend that money? Yeah, we are going to talk free agency preview next week. So, Next week, we'll really get into the names that are out there right now. But I am seeing some comments as to who the Orioles should sign. People are saying sign an ace, sign Carlos Rodon. There are a couple aces that are set to hit the market. Rodon, I think, fits into that category. Uh, Justin Verlander, if he decides to not return to Houston, fits into that category. Jacob deGrom, certainly, if he chooses free agency. Uh, Clayton Kershaw will be a free agent. So there are a few names out there, but... They're going to be hard to get, and aces are going to command quite a lot in the free agency market. But the Orioles could also try to upgrade if they don't get one of those four guys in free agency. They could try to use that $11 million and add another $11 million, go get a $22 million pitcher. Right. There are a couple guys out there. I mean, again, not to get too deep into the names, but, you know, Carlos Carrasco is going to be out there. Tyler Anderson, who's coming off a very good year, is going to be out there. But I think what Jordan Lyles gives you at $11 million is certainty. You know almost exactly what you're getting with Jordan Lyles. And you're not going to get A stuff. You're not going to get number two in a rotation stuff. You're not going to get an all-star pitcher. You're going to get a lot of innings, and you're going to get about a 4 5 ERA. And that, to some teams, is more valuable than somebody like a Tyler Anderson, who, yes, he's coming off an outstanding year, but you don't know if that's going to be him every single season or if this was a fluke. For some of these guys, Carrasco or somebody else who has had times, they've missed significant time over the course of their career, or guys that have had injury concern, Lyles has been very durable. And again, the ceiling isn't as high, but the floor is very high. And so Lyle's value, that $11 million, you say $11 million for a guy who was a 4 5 ERA, that doesn't quite make sense. But it's because he's giving you that every single season, and he's giving you 32 starts a year with a ton of innings. So, yes, he's, he may not ever reach an all-star game, but he is a stable force in a rotation. And I think when you look at the free agent starting pitchers that would command around $11 million, It's probably a group that includes names like you mentioned. Tyler Anderson, Sean Mania, I mean, Andrew Heaney, Michael Waka. I wouldn't really be thrilled with any of those starting pitchers over Jordan Lyles. Right. Because like you said, you know what Lyles gives you. 
And also, there's something to be said for the fact that he was already in the organization. The yes. pitching coaches have already started to work with him. So I don't really think it makes sense to not sign Jordan Lyles for $11 million and then go sign an Andrew Heaney for 12 Yeah, he's more of a variability. He's more right. of a an unknown quantity when you go out and get somebody outside the organization. So my question becomes, do you sign Jordan Lyles for $11 million or... Do you look to upgrade the starting rotation a little bit more rather than going after a number three or a number four starter? Do you go after somebody who could be a number two starter right. in the 15 to 20 million range? Some names that I found that I'm just guessing would command around that price value. Jamison Tyone, Taiwan Walker, Chris Bassett, Noah Syndergaard, Nathan Eovaldi are some names that I just tossed around as maybe they get 15 to 20 million. Right. I think that's the question. Right. I don't know if the Orioles are in the running for a Carlos Rodon, for a Justin Verlander, somebody that they'd have to pay over $30 million. They certainly could, and yeah. it would make sense to go get a Rodon if you just want an ace for the next five, six seasons. But if the Orioles aren't looking to totally break the bank on a starting pitcher because they're looking elsewhere in terms of their contract talks... Maybe you go after a number two, number three starter that's a little bit more expensive than Jordan Lyles, but still gives you an upgrade to the starting rotation. Some of those names you mentioned, again, I was even thinking of variability. You know, I'm thinking Noah Syndergaard has had significant injuries over the course of yep. his career. And the Orioles have to be convinced that that guy is worth an extra four or five million. That's why he's not getting 30. A season, exactly. And that's why he's probably getting a short-term deal as opposed to a long-term deal. I, I look back at... The deal the Orioles gave Alex Cobb several years ago before the 2018 season, that's exactly what you don't want to happen. Somebody who has had ace stuff, has been an all-star caliber pitcher over the course of his career, but had significant injury concerns and had a low floor, and they gave him $40 million guaranteed. That's something you can't afford to happen with this team right now. You need more of a sure thing. And timing of this is going to be fascinating because – it's not like Lyles is just sitting out there for $11 million. They have an option that they have to decide upon by four days after the World Series concludes. So they can look at their board and say, we want to get a Chris Bassett, we want to get a Noah Syndergaard, but we have to decide if we want Lyles right now. And they can't assume that they're going to get Bassett or they're going to get Syndergaard or... What were some of the other names you mentioned there? Uh, Jamison Tyone, Tyone, Nathan Avaldi. What if they get priced out of all of those guys and they they decline Lyle's option, he signs with another team, and all of those guys suddenly disappear and the market dries up? And they go, well, we missed the boat on all of those guys. We've got to overpay for somebody now who is in the lower tier. So they have to make a decision on Lyle's before they make a decision on any of these other guys. So are they going to go for the safe early option with Lyles or are they going to wait or frankly they could do both if they really wanted to if they really think that the rotation needs a significant upgrade they could pick up Lyles option and then go ahead and look at some free agents as well and say we can go get an ace we can go get a second caliber second tier pitcher and you know what that may slow the development of a DL Hall or somebody else in our rotation, but we just decided we need starting pitching this badly to compete in this division. I think it's an interesting question because I really do like Jordan Lyles. And on this podcast, I've been a huge proponent of what Lyles has given the Orioles in 2022. As we mentioned, he has been massive for the bullpen. He has been a great veteran presence. He gives you a lot of good qualities. However, the Orioles are ahead of schedule. Yeah. This is... When the Orioles signed Jordan Lyles, they were not expecting this $11 million option to go to a pitcher who you potentially need to help make you make a quality playoff push. And when I look at Jordan Lyles, you know what he gives you. He's going to give you around a 450 ERA. He's going to throw a ton of innings, and that has value. But is it enough to say hey, I'd start Jordan Lyles in game three of a five-game series in the yeah. playoffs. You have to seriously start looking at that if you're the Baltimore Orioles. If you're looking at a potential wild card series and saying we need to throw three pitchers and they need to shove in a wild card series, is Jordan Lyles one of your three or 
do you, again, spend a little bit more money, maybe 15 to 20 million, get a Tyone, a Cindergaard, somebody of that tier that you're more comfortable with throwing in game two or game three. You also, though, could lean on your youth and yeah. say, if we enter the playoffs, and we're I love that we're thinking this far ahead, this is, but this, this is, is great. Yeah. This is now a legitimate possibility for this right. team. I think that you could look ahead and say, if Grayson Rodriguez is who we think he is mm-hmm. as a rookie, there's a playoff starter. Sure. If John Means comes back by July and is the guy that he was prior to Tommy John, that's a playoff starter. Yep. If Dean Kramer, if his 2022 season wasn't a fluke, that's a playoff starter. So I think you could have three potential guys right there. I mean, Kyle we Bradish at the back Kyle end Bradish. of the season. Kyle Bradish has a higher ceiling than Kramer. Could have a higher ceiling than Means, potentially, with how much talent that he has. You could talk about four guys there. However, again, question marks. There, yep. are, question, there are downsides to all four of these guys. Means could not be the pitcher that he was prior to injury. He could suffer a setback. Could take a little bit longer for him to build up his workload. Grayson Rodriguez, we know that we've seen rookie starters struggle in this league. What if he has a 5 ERA come September and he shows flashes, but he looks every bit 22, 23 years old that that other starters have looked? So there are no certainties right now in this rotation. Very few certainties, I'd say. So do you really want to, to roll the dice on the youth that you have right now and say, we think that we can get to the postseason and maybe win a postseason series with the guys that we already have. And then, you know what? We have Lyles as a backup. If one of those guys doesn't work out, we can start Jordan Lyles in game three and be okay with it. Not feel great, but be okay with it. But again, if one of those guys doesn't work out, start Jamison Tyone in game three. Right. You could start Noah Syndergaard in game three. If you're confident, you can sign them. Right. It's a hard question because I think if there is a two or three or four million dollar gap between Jordan Lyles, I'm going to keep saying Syndergaard, that's the one name out of the group that we're just going to use as the example here. Sure. If you can sign Jordan Lyles for $11 million or you can sign Noah Syndergaard to a two-year $30 million deal and there's only a $4 million difference in that annual value, I say go Syndergaard. But as you said, it is safer to sign Jordan Lyles to $11 million. And then as you said, what if he gets into free agency? There's a bidding war for these guys. And all of a sudden, Syndergaard goes for $22 million rather than fifteen. million. Yeah. That's a huge difference. Right. Also, it's hard to say. And again, Syndergaard is a good example because he shows he is the highest risk Highest reward, right. I think, option on the market. He missed what two full seasons, yeah, when he with injury, and the Phillies have really barely used him as a starter during this postseason run. So he is he is the exact opposite of a Jordan Lyles, to use an example. The other question I think is: Is Jordan Lyles worth eleven million dollars on his own? If he were just a free agent sitting out there on the market, would other teams pay Jordan Lyles eleven million dollars? Are we overvaluing? what Lyles brings to a team. I look at last year and last offseason, what $11 million a year would have gotten you. Pitchers that got about $11 million average annual value. Steven Matz signed for one one year, $11 million. Prior to that, in 2021, he was coming off a year where he had a 382 ERA and 152 innings pitched. If you can get somebody of that quality, that'd be good. Alex Cobb, Signed a two-year, $25 million deal. Again, high risk, high reward. Found the Giants and ended up becoming a solid starter for them. So he signed for about $11 million average annual value. Yusei Kikuchi, three years, 36. He had a 4-4-1 ERA. He was a higher risk, high reward guy who did not really hit the reward. Uh, Anthony DiSclafani probably signed a little bit of a discount deal with San Francisco, three years, 36, so $12 million a year. And then James Paxton, one year, $10 million, and then really didn't pitch at all. So you see some hits and some misses for $11 million a year. And Lyles fits right in between that as I think the Orioles got good value for $7 million a year. But would he get $11 million if he was just sitting out there on the open market? I think it's a good question. I will say, though, I think... As This is going to be a very broad and kind of weird question for you here, Paul. But I think 
it what is depends on how we are looking at the Baltimore Orioles. <laughs> if a contending team is signing Jordan Lyles, a team that is hoping to win 90 games, make the playoffs, right. hopefully make a run. If a contending team is signing Jordan Lyles, I don't know if they give him $11 million. Yeah. And if they give him close to $11 million, his role is, hey, you're going to be a number four, number five starter. We need you to stay healthy. We need you to eat innings. But you're not going to be one of the high-end starters in this rotation. We're not going to give you high-leverage playoff games. You're going to do what we need you to do in the regular season, which is eat innings. And if we get to the playoffs, probably won't start games. Maybe you'll come out of the bullpen. But we're not signing you to be a number two, number three. So how are we viewing the Baltimore Orioles here in this offseason, I think is the question. Are we viewing them as a team that is going to be, again, hovering around 500, winning 80, 85 games? Are we viewing them as a team that is trying to make a push, trying to win 90-plus games, make the playoffs, make a run? Because I think if you're viewing them as the latter, then Jordan Lyles is almost a little too safe. Almost a little too safe, I would say. But still gives you value. But still gives you value. And maybe there's a team out there that thinks that they can do to Jordan Lyles what the Dodgers did to Tyler Anderson. Sure. The Do- the Dodgers last Andrew year... Andrew Heaney, same thing. Andrew Heaney signed Tyler Anderson for one year, $8 million, turned him into an all-star this past year. 273 ERA, and literally almost the exact terms for Jordan Lyles' deal. I don't think... Uh, Anderson had any options in his contract, but it was almost the same for the first year. $7 million for Lyles, $8 million for Anderson. Maybe there's a team out there that thinks we can do the same thing with Jordan Lyles. We see something in there. But frankly, I think the Orioles squeezed everything that can be squeezed out of Lyles out of him. Again, I'm not looking at the advanced numbers that teams are privy to that we are not. So maybe there is some kind of gem that is flying under the radar in terms of his analytical numbers. But I think the Orioles squeezed just about as much as you can get out of Jordan Lyles, out of Jordan Lyles. And if there's a team that would inspire confidence as a Dodgers or a Rays would to sign a veteran and say, hey, let's get the most out of this guy and try to turn him into a different pitcher, I would say if if there's a handful of teams in the bigs that can do it, the Orioles are probably one of them. They are. Given the track record that we've seen, especially from this year, with a guy like Austin Voth. Yeah. I mean, he came over from Washington and turned into a completely different starter. Yeah. So I think if there was something with Jordan Lyles that was kind of, you know, under the covers, ready, ready to be unlocked, the Orioles were probably going to find it. But again, that brings up that, you know, goes back to your point about, is he too safe? Is Lyles too safe? For the Orioles. And I think team I think people were looking at the Tyler Anderson deal for the Dodgers and saying, is that too safe? Tyler Anderson, that's not an upgrade to your rotation. Uh, eight million dollars. Why are you just throwing away money on somebody that's gonna give you a four five oh ERA and then he was an all star? But I will say, you know, I don't know as much about the Dodgers as I know about the Orioles, right. but I think when that signing was made, the idea was you signed a Tyler Anderson or an Andrew Heaney and said, okay, if there's injuries, which there yes. were for the Dodgers, there yes. were a lot of injuries, Walker Bueller, Dustin May, Yep, they didn't have all of the starters they were hoping to this year. And so the Dodgers signed some safe veterans yeah. and said, okay, if you need to be a number four, number five, you can get in there. I don't think that's how the Orioles are viewing Jordan Lyles, or at least not how we're talking about him right now as somebody who is a safe four or five if you need him. If the Orioles re-sign Jordan Lyles, he's probably consistently in your rotation, and he's a number three, number four. But if everything hits, if everything works out, and everybody stays healthy, maybe in August he's not. This is true. Maybe in August you have a rotation of Grayson Rodriguez, John Means, Kyle Bradish, Dean Kramer, D.L. Hall, and Jordan Lyles is your in-case break glass in case of emergency starter. Sure. Slash long man out out of the bullpen, which... Again, good problem to have. Yeah. So I think that the Dodgers, I'm not saying Tyler Anderson's the reason they won 111 games, but having that pitching depth is the reason that they were able to go from start to finish and be one of the best teams ever. Yeah, and they they won on the margins. That's something we've always talked about with the Orioles is, yeah, the big signings will come and you need to hit on those, 
But the Dodgers were successful in part this year, as you mentioned, because of guys like Andrew Heaney, because of Tyler Anderson, because of guys that filled in like Trace Thompson. That's winning on the margins, finding quality players without giving out big contracts. But I think the Orioles need to be a little bit more aggressive. They're in the AL East. There is a distinct possibility that four AL East teams make the playoffs next year. Yeah. That's how good this division is. I mean, the Red Sox could spend money and bounce back. They're always a threat. And three AL East teams made the playoffs this year. Yeah. And they could all very and well make <laughs> And, like, the Yankees will probably have money to spend because they always do. Yeah. The Blue Jays have been consistently aggressive in free agency. And the Tampa Bay Rays are the Tampa Bay Rays. Yeah. And I think if you're the Orioles... And, frankly, there's reason to believe the Red Sox could get, be better next year. Yeah. I, they have money to spend as well. Yeah. They could go get guys. And their pitching rotation was incredibly hurt this yeah. year. They'll have guys coming back. So my point there is that you need to kind of play with the hand you're dealt. And the hand they're dealt is the AL East, which is incredibly competitive. And you know what Jordan Lyles is giving you, which is like a 450 ERA. Not that I'm really looking at pitcher wins, but he was 12 and 11 this year. I know it's not a pitcher stat, but that's probably what he's going to give you around a 500 record in games that he starts. Yeah. I think you need to spend a little bit more money, be a little bit more aggressive. I know it's a risk going after somebody that you're hoping is in the 15 to $20 million range, I think that's what I'd do. So I was going to ask you, and that kind of answered the question. Yeah. If you were Mike Elias, four days after the World Series ends, are you saying yes or no to the Jordan Lyles option? I'm saying no. Wow. Because I think you need to be a little bit more aggressive. I would go after kind of that, that middle tier. I mean, of course, you would take a look at a Carlos Rodon or a Justin Verlander. If they want to come to Baltimore, great. Yeah. I mean, if you can get a Rodon, I mean, he is 29 years old, had a 288 ERA last season. I think it's at least a possibility that the Orioles try to shell out the money for Rodon, but that's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Just imagine a playoff wild card series where the Orioles are throwing Rodon. Gray Rod, Rod means. means. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There is a third door here that is, I think, the lowest possibility option of these three. The first two being pick up the option, second being say no to the option. That is, say no to the option and try to re-sign yep. him for a lower I was just going to say, you could say no to the option and say, hey, that $7 million from last year worked out pretty well. Yeah. How about do that again? Exactly. So that is also an option, but you could also, by the, because uh, clearly Jordan Lyles likes being here. He yep. likes this front office. He likes the guys in the clubhouse. He was uh, one of the more vocal guys in this clubhouse and, and was every bit the leader that they were hoping. But you also run the risk of declining that option and said, hey, we'd love to have you back. And he says, ah, I think the uh, A's are going to give me 14 a year. And he walks. Yeah. So that is a possibility if you go that route. I think the way I'm looking at it right now, is that the Orioles are ahead of schedule. Also, the A's aren't going to give Jordan <laughs> They They won't. Maybe no. the Angels. <laughs> <Yeah>. Maybe. <laughs> the Orioles need to have, in order to have a playoff caliber season in 2023, you need to have a playoff caliber offseason. Yeah. And Jordan Lyles is a safe option. He is a good option. None of this take of mine here is anything against Jordan Lyles because, as we said, we know what he gives you, but what he gives you is a lot of value. So it's not a knock on Lyles, but I think you need to have a playoff caliber offseason, which is be a little bit more aggressive. Go after an ace if you can. Go after a number two or number three starter. Jordan Lyles, it's, it's going to be a 450 ERA, which is good, but it's not great. Here's the thing, and this is not my money. Yeah. Here's, <laughs> so, you know, we're talking about all these, you know, would you pay so-and-so X amount, and again, this is not our money that we're paying here, so we're just throwing out fake dollars. And we're amounts. also guesstimating on these yes, we have dollar no amounts. Idea. I mean, Noah Syndergaard could get $25 million a year. We have no idea. We're guessing. Here's what I would do. I would pick up the option because I would feel a lot safer heading into free agency with somebody in-house, feeling like you don't have to overpay for a second-tier or third-tier starting pitcher on the free agent market. You know you're getting a good veteran. You know you're having a good leader. And if it gets to the point where your rotation is overstuffed in July, guess what? You can trade him. 
or you can relegate him to the bullpen, you can solve that problem later. I would pick up the option, and I would still look for free agents. I would still survey the market and say, maybe there's a higher-risk guy that we can go out and sign like a Noah Syndergaard. And we have Jordan Lyles already in this rotation. So if Syndergaard doesn't work out, if he gets hurt, or if we sign a higher-risk guy uh, in free agency and he really struggles, we have a little bit more safety. So I would try to do both. I would try to have my cake and eat it too. I would try to pick up Jordan Lyles and still sign a higher risk second tier free agent. Probably won't have money for Lyles and Rodon and maybe a bat, but maybe you have money for Lyles and Syndergaard and a bat. So that's that's what I would do. What do you think the Orioles will do? I think they'll pick up the option. I wow. think, as you mentioned, he is a safe in-house possibility for the starting rotation. And honestly, I think if they don't pick up the option, I think that third door possibility that you mentioned doesn't have a low percent chance of happening. I think it's pretty plausible that the Orioles would say, hey, we're not going to give you $11 million. We think that $7 million price tag was right around where you're going to get in free agency elsewhere. Yeah. How about you just come get it with us? Because we... Loved having you here. Jordan Lyles, as you mentioned, loved being in Baltimore. He said he'd like to come back. So maybe the Orioles just say, hey, we'll give you $7.5 million, $8 million. Come back right around that number. We save a few million on the margins, and we go sign a backup catcher with a couple extra million, or right. we sign a utility infielder with a couple extra million. I think it's entirely possible that if they don't pick up this option, Jordan Lyles is still on this team and the Orioles are just closer to what he would get elsewhere. Yeah, I really don't feel confident either way. This is a toss-up I me. think it's 55-45 that they do pick up his option, but again, it's close. Yeah. It is close. And we know about Mike Elias, and this is a smart decision-maker thing to do, which is to wait as long as you have to make the decision. Nobody's forcing your hand to make this decision early. You don't have to make it right now or before the World Series. Wait until the last day, the last hour, like you did with Jose Iglesias, and make sure that you're confident making this decision. So uh, I expect Michael Elias to take it up to the 11th hour with this decision, and uh, I think it's going to be a toss-up, a total toss-up. I would not be shocked either way. Me neither. All right. Well, uh, we are going to dive headfirst into free agency. Next week, we're going to do our free agency preview and then the long-awaited free agency bracket Woo. the week after that. So all these names, these hypothetical names, will be on our board, I think. We're going to have probably our four categories. We like to go with the four regions yep. and a bracket. And we'll tease it next week, but I think we're looking at backup catcher. I think we're looking at starting pitcher. I think we're looking at other position players, as in first base, outfield, DH, not a position player, but, yep, you know, a bat, uh, mostly bat first. And then we're looking at middle infielder as the four regions to determine who the Orioles might sign. And I will say, we do joke around with our guesses a lot on the Mass and All Access podcast, but uh, to pump our own tires a little bit here, Paul, we did correctly predict two free agency signings. They were, we had our final four. And two of the names in our final four yep. were players that the Orioles ended up signing in Robinson Chirinos and Matt Harvey. Robinson Chirinos made it to the finals. Didn't win the finals, even though I would have liked him to. You were a little bitter. A little bitter about it. I, th I picked Marvin Gonzalez. Yeah, not a bad pick. But that's to say that if you are tuning into the free agency preview and the free agency bracket, we know what we're talking about. We were pretty right. spot on last yeah. year. We're, we're, we're going to take that prediction to the bank. Yeah. Maybe. Chris Owings was on the bracket last year as well. Didn't advance very far, but no, he, did not. He, was, he was there. I think he was a first round exit. He was, but he was on there. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's the prediction that we're going to use. We're not going to discuss our other missed predictions. No. But, why, uh, would, why would we do that? No. Um, so let us know who you think should be on the bracket. Let us know what positions you think we should be highlighting and discussing that maybe we're overlooking right now. At Paul Mancano is my Twitter handle. At Brandon Morty is his. Of course, please listen to, subscribe to the podcast on all of your favorite podcast platforms, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts. Give us a review. Give us five stars and share it with your friends. Tim Leonard was our producer today. Thanks, Tim, for Brendan Mortensen. I'm Paul Mancano. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next week.